Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliaroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives, greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our virtual Enlightenment Salon of October 23rd, 2022. I am pleased today to bring to you a highly thought-provoking discussion about historical approaches to aging that ended up not working out as intended. And I think there are some useful, instructive lessons to derive from that information as we ourselves seek ways to reverse biological human aging, hopefully within our lifetimes. Joining us today is a distinguished panel of our U.S. Transhumanist Party officers and members, including our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia, our Director of Applied Innovation, David Shoemaker, our Director of Longevity Outreach, Ben Balweg, our Legislative Director, Jason Geringer, and two of our distinguished members, Alan Crowley, who is a science fiction author and frequent viewer of our salons. We always enjoy his commentary. And Kent Kamish, whom we had as a guest for a previous virtual Enlightenment Salon on June 6, 2021. He is developing the first in the world molecular gaming console, the Demon Poor 64. We discussed that endeavor extensively during our salon last year. Our special guest today and our presenter is Eric Hennigan. Eric is a senior software engineer at Google and a volunteer genomics data scientist at the University of Southern California. He holds Bachelor of Sciences degrees in Applied Mathematics and Physics from University of California, Los Angeles, and a PhD in Computer Science from University of California, Irvine. He enjoys communicating what he has learned to others and has even acted as instructor of record for University of California, Irvine and Cal State Fullerton while still a graduate student. And he notes, despite his formal education, he recommends self-study as a path to skills improvement. And this is indeed one of the major hopes for us for the virtual enlightenment salons, that you, the viewers, will use them as an occasion for your own self-study on the many subjects that we discuss today, as well as the interconnections among those subjects. So. Thank you very much to our illustrious panel for joining us today. And Eric, please feel free to begin your presentation. I'm sure it will be fascinating. Uh, thank you, Gennady. Uh, it's good to be here with the Transhumanist Party and talk about some of the theories of aging that have died. Um, it, it turns out also that uh, a few of my pictures will be from artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a, an example of a couple of friends having beers. These are scientists who had theories that didn't make it. And this image is two skeletons having a drink by the illustrious artist Dali. I'd like to uh, begin a little bit by talking about myself, and then we will decide upon a definition of aging. It turns out that there's quite a few factors there and then talk about theories of aging that didn't survive encounters with the evidence. So a bit about myself. Uh, when I was in graduate school a very long time ago, uh, say about 2010, I had my first encounter with the concept of longevity, the ability for us to live forever, when I read Nick Bostrom's uh, fable of the dragon tyrant. If you haven't read it, uh, just search for that he has it on his website. It is a wonderful read. And I have to admit, from being a computer science mind, 
I didn't understand the story itself as when it's presented as a fable. It, fortunately, though, Bostrom, being a philosopher, had a nice outline of moral lessons at the very end of the story that made everything clear to me, what all the metaphors were that I missed. It's not just a story of some stuff that happened. Uh, if you don't like reading the long form content, CGB Gray has done a YouTube video. You can also search for that. The story in its simplest form is about a dragon that tyrannizes a, a village and then the villagers over a very long period of time figure out that they can defeat this dragon. Otherwise, it is inescapable. Everybody dies through the mouth of the dragon. My second encounter, as I'm looking through longevity a few years later, is Aubrey de Grey. And he is a distinguished fellow that has come up with the idea of engineered senescence. He has for at least 20 years been promoting the idea that if we can change the way our bodies work, then we might be able to get immortality or at least no intrinsic mortality. Say a bus might hit you and you die, but you won't die of old age, which I think is a very good position. And I look forward to all of the research, and there's a heck of a lot of it, that needs to be done to counteract all of the things that he points out that could go wrong in our bodies and that do over time. My third impetus, and the one that brings me here today, occurred only a few years ago. I, th I think about two, maybe three years ago. I was um, in the bathroom shaving my whiskers, and I noticed that there was a gray hair. It, it was all stiff and wiry, and it wasn't the same colors as the others. And I saw that as the beginning of the end for me, right? My time here is now, uh, the clock is ticking, and I don't have long left. If we're going to reach biological immortality, we got to start studying this today. So I, I freaked out, and I started learning a lot about biology. I would like to comment, though, that when I was in high school in before 2000, biology was a very messy subject. It, in, it still is a very messy subject, but a lot of the advances in information theory and computer science are ideas about engineering, uh, our ability to sequence the genome and figure out biological circuits or motifs has been enormously advanced over the last 20 years. And so all of the things that I felt were really cool as an engineer are being brought to play in biology today, which is just absolutely fascinating and enables me to make a transition. Uh, the content for this slide is going to come from a handful of books. These are aimed at the public. They're not super in-depth research. However, in their appendix, they do have an enormous number of citations of peer-reviewed articles especially Aubrey de Grey's book has that. He is uh, definitely a scientist within the field directly. There's Ageless by Andrew Steele, Cracking the Aging Code by Josh Middledorf and Ending Aging by Aubrey de Grey. Most of my learning has been from books like this. So my depth of knowledge is a little bit lacking, but my breadth of knowledge is certainly there from having read say a dozen of these kinds of works. Let's talk about the definition of aging. We all we know from observation that we all sort of get old and die. And as part of the process of getting old, we get ever more frail. So perhaps this is just an example of the second law of thermodynamics, where we are progressively weakening, deteriorating, accumulating damage, et cetera, et cetera. But when we look at various organisms, they don't all do this at the same time scale. Mice live only two to three years. Humans live 70 to 100 years. Uh, the Greenland shark can live 300, 350 years. We actually don't know their top age. These organisms are also not closed systems, right? So the second law of thermodynamics that talks about the ever increasing amount of entropy applies to a system that has no energy coming in and out. But all organisms certainly consume energy from the environment, right? They're not closed systems. 
So instead, maybe we should look at something more statistical. Instead of our bodies wearing out over time, let's look at the risk that we might die in any given year. Well, in uh, an environment that's not curated for our well-being, it can kill you, right? Uh, a rampaging lion or a tiger or a wolf uh, several centuries ago might have got us. Bacterial infections might get us if we get scratched. Those are not really prevalent uh, attackers these days, right? We, we have secured the environment for our well-being, but we still become older and more frail. So this is an intrinsic property of, of our own biology, right? Why do we become weaker? Let's compare a few different animals. Uh, so it turns out we can draw these really interesting curves that plot our risk of death. Uh, this one also happens to have our fertility on it. And we notice that for humans, that's the very first chart, we are fertile in our younger years and that declines with age, especially like after menopause, there's a very steep drop for women. And our risk of death uh, certainly increases, right? That's the red line, our mortality. In the younger years, it's pretty flat. And then as we age, we accumulate uh, chronic diseases. We have an increasing risk of injuries that didn't fully heal. And we accumulate these sorts of things. There's also cellular-like damage, um, diabetes, atherosclerosis, Alzheimer's. All of these things are trying to get us. And eventually, but today, they do. <clears throat> so we have a mortality curve that's sort of pushed up and to the right. Our risk of death is very low in the beginning. And then after about 50 or 60, it starts dropping off. And at 100, it's really steep indeed. And various animals have this kind of curve. There are a handful of other animals, though, which sort of have a neutral risk of death. It remains pretty flat throughout their entire lifetime. I would like to draw a lot of attention here to the hydra. That would be, uh, oh, you can't see my mouse. That would be this one here at, at the bottom, the second one. The hydra, it turns out, is immortal. It achieves this by becoming an adult medusa, and then after a while, I'm not sure what triggers it, reverting back into a cellular, uh, a young hydra. And it goes back and forth between adult stage and youthful stage. Why it does this, not sure, but it's very interesting. It doesn't seem to have any uh, increase intrinsically of dying year over year. Although the environment, especially in its younger stage, right, might be a little bit higher than at the adult stage due to predation. But the risk of death constant year to year. It's uh, fertility also constant. And the survivorship is going to be clearly a, just a straight line. Oh, I noticed there's a question as to whether or not DNA is considered immortal, uh, perhaps due to replication. And we'll definitely get there when I talk about the germline. Now, even more interesting, there's a few organisms that we know of mostly trees, but here you can also see the desert tortoise, where the survivorship is a little bit flattened down. And what that means is that the longer you live, the lower your risk of death with each passing year. Why would that happen? Well, think of a fish that gets larger. The larger it gets, the less likely it is to be eaten, right? You don't see any organisms gobbling up a whale in a single gulp right? And they're doing that to others. And it can be, this is also true for fish, that the larger they get, the more fertile and fecund they get, and the more offspring they produce. So there's certainly a selection bias there for growing larger and spreading and reproducing. And what that means, it raises a very important question. Why is it the case that we suffer an increased mortality with every year, and these other very small number of organisms don't. There's something going on there. So I come to the definition of aging that I'll be using for this talk. And a lot of the people in the field agree with something 
close to this, it's a year over year increased mortality risk that is intrinsic to the organism. It's not uh, environmental predation or things like that. It's the longer you live, the more likely internally things are going to break down and then you can become frailer. Usually the act of death, especially in the wild, will be extrinsic. There is going to be one of these things that causes you to die. So for example, uh, a deer that's getting older runs slower and then it cannot escape the predator. Ah, yes, the theories of aging that didn't make it. So this is, happens to be my favorite. I will start off with it. The fixed number of heartbeats theory. Uh, I happen to love this one because it means I shouldn't be exercising lest I use up my heartbeats prematurely. Now, what's interesting about this theory is if you look at the number of heartbeats per lifetime in any given animal, and here we have like rats, hamsters, and mice, they're very small. Uh, there happens to be elephants in here and whales. They're very large. Larger animals have a much slower heartbeat, small animals a much faster one. For example, rats and mice can be on the order of like 300 beats a minute. Elephants are on the order of 50 to 60. Humans also 50 to 60 at rest if you're in good health, uh, 180 if you're exercising pretty hard. There's a there's a reasonable range there. But over a lifetime, it's roughly a billion beats, plus or minus 10 percentage. And that's an interesting, tight, concise range. But if you draw the plot in a different way, the heart rate per expected life years, you see that humans are remarkably standing out from this crowd. I'm not sure why that is, but it's certainly evidence against the fact that you might have a fixed number of heartbeats. Now, would you use this uh, theory to make a drug that reduced your heart rate? Maybe you could get it all the way to zero. No, let's not do that. That would kill us. Very bad idea. So this theory of aging is not something that you would act on necessarily in order to increase your lifespan. And it's clearly a correlate, right? The counting of heartbeats isn't what causes me to age. It's merely tracking the time that is passed, right? The clock doesn't cause time. It measures it. And although I like to use this to excuse my lack of exercise, uh, saying that I conserve heartbeats by resting all the time, it's, it's actually not very clear cut. If I exercise, I definitely I have a very large usage of heartbeats during the exercise itself, but that can cause my resting heart rate to lower during the time that I'm not exercising, and I very presumably get a benefit from that extra effect there. Right, and so this is plausible in the fact that we roughly have a billion heartbeats, and we know that a high resting heart rate does indicate an increased mortality risk, although it's usually due and in concert with other things like hypertension. And this theory definitely doesn't survive because humans are outliers here. We're not part of the trend for whatever reason. Uh, the beats are counting the passage of time, not causing it. And although lo larger animals have a lower beat per minute and live longer, this seems to be the case across species. If you look within a species, the larger individuals have an increased mortality risk, right? You don't want to be obese no matter what animal you are. So maybe it's just body size here instead of fixed number of heartbeats. We can look at another theory that doesn't make it. Uh, this is the rate of living theory. So we happen to know uh, from Max Rubner that I mentioned earlier, larger animals have a slower metabolism and they live longer. Very interesting. Uh, and Max Kleber looked at some data like this and he came up with an approximation where the rate of your metabolism is proportional to how large your body is and that's organism, so mouse per versus elephant, to the power of three fourths. And that's just an empirically derived observation. And then 
Denham Harmon figured out that, well, maybe it's the fact that faster or higher metabolic animals happen to be using their mitochondria at a significant rate. And the mitochondria are producing, they're not perfect, producing free radicals that can cause damage and therefore aging. So we can take all of these things and many animals and plot them on a lovely little chart here. And what we see is that the metabolic rate and the mass do happen to scale with each other pretty well. And so it might indicate that the smaller animals don't live very long because they're smaller and the larger animals live a long time because their metabolism is slower. Well, it's plausible because the data clearly shows that. And we know that metabolism causes cellular damage. But again, like I said in the previous theory, it, it's a little bit bunk because larger individuals within the species don't live longer, right? The obese mouse has a lot of health defects that the thin fit mouse does not. And that causes an increase in mortality risk, which is how we measure aging. And Cleaver's law is really a result of energy physics, right? It's a constraint on how much energy you have to use given your body size. You have to intake energy and then spread it around the body. Each of the cells use it up and then you waste to the environment. And this is physics, right? So it's not a cause of aging. It's just a constraint on the design of the organism. Oh, again, a lovely picture by Dolly. So now we come to a broad theory of aging. Maybe it's the mutation accumulation. For example, in, the, in this slide here, I mentioned that a faster metabolism produces free radicals. Those free radicals cause cellular damage. Maybe that cellular damage is what causes us to age. So there could be a... Um, on the evolutionary scale, a buildup of age causing genetic variants. Say there's a mutation in DNA, it doesn't get weeded out or selected against, it will persist across many generations, and we will have a accumulation of bad genes that each causes us to die. So this is a core part of evolution, right? It is definitely the case that evolution harnesses mutations that occur within individuals or in the crossbreeding to create an individual in order to test various fitness it, with the environment. And if those tests survive, then they can keep the mutation and continue reproduction. If the test fails, then they don't reproduce and it is weeded out. But it takes an evolutionary amount of time to do this weeding process, to filter the good genes from the bad genes. And here, good and bad is the ones that let you live a long time versus the ones that kill you early. And so there's a lovely prediction that this theory comes out with, that aging will only appear in zoos because only in zoos do we keep the animals away from predation so that we can see what happens in their old age. But this theory is also bunk <laughs> because whether the animal is in a zoo or not, it becomes progressively more frail as it gets older, right? And this means it is less fit for its environment, it cannot outrun the predator, and it gets eaten. However, we have also seen aging genes discovered in yeast and worms like C. elegans. And it turns out that there is one such gene which can, if you knock it out, delete it from the genome of the worm, causes something like a 50x increase in the, more, in the life expectancy of that worm. Now, are humans so lucky as to have such a gene? Uh, sadly not, as far as we can tell. These aging genes, though, have homologs that are conserved in humans and all the animals between us and worms and yeast, right? So that's very interesting. Why did evolution not get rid of these genes that caused the organism to die out? We didn't weed out these genes, they got kept may be mutated so they're homologs, but kept. So that doesn't really work well for this theory, right? Although we're saying here that the 
genes are present and they may cause us to die, we're not particularly sure that they are causing us to die you know, specifically. It might be the case that those genes are very necessary for other attributes, right? Most genes have a multifold effect in what they do. So it's not just that, oh, there's five genes that cause aging, let's identify them and get rid of them. No, there's five genes that cause aging, but they benefit you in other ways. And if you get rid of them, maybe you die earlier or don't make it at all. So this theory of mutation accumulation on the evolutionary scale doesn't really seem to hold up. I mentioned free radicals earlier, right? As part of the mitochondria doing its thing of generating energy. They have this electron transport chain to produce energy for the cell, but it leaks. So like one to 3% of these electrons or, or positively charged hydrogens don't uh, uh, get out of this transport chain and then interact with other chemicals in the mitochondria itself. And these are called reactive oxygen species. There are, um, they will quickly produce things like hydrogen peroxide, which will go on to interact with other things in the mitochondria. This can disrupt the mitochondrial DNA or a bunch of the proteins in the mitochondria and cause it to malfunction. So what happens here is that there's oxidative damage to the mitochondria itself. That's the powerhouse of the cell. And when it accumulates too much damage, it will go defunct and that cell will not have very much energy and probably die. We know that this occurs. It is definitely observational, but it's maybe not the best theory of aging, right? The damage occurs, so it's plausible. And we know that accumulation of damage on an individual time scale definitely has an effect. But it might be uh, not the best theory of aging because it turns out that if you take a large number of antioxidants, it doesn't necessarily extend your lifespan. And in fact, it might reduce your lifespan. This was found in the case of uh, vitamin E, which happens to be an antioxidant. Increased amounts of vitamin E can decrease your lifespan. What is going on here? It turns out that the reactive oxygen species are used by the cell as a signaling mechanism. If you wipe them out, clean them up, then you dampen that signaling mechanism. And with that mechanism dampened, or with the signal dampened, then the mitochondria also still don't perform very well. So it turns out that we need to keep these things as a signal, even though that signal is definitely damaging. Terrible situation that we're in. And the damage that they cause is not necessarily correlated to longevity or our lifespan, right? There's uh, the example of a naked roll mat and a mouse they both have very similar metabolic requirements, similar number of heartbeat uh, speed, but one lives 32 years and the other less than four. So there's a very large discrepancy here. I, I do wanna point out that the, the, the free radicals is a very compelling theory and we definitely know that there is damage there so I'd like to say that damage to the cell is not necessarily damage to the organism. We'll talk about the garbage that accumulates. So when these reactive oxygen species uh, cause damage, the mitochondria can go defunct or those species can leak out of the mitochondria and, and screw up a bunch of proteins or other things within the cell, the cellular cytoplasm. And here's an example of hydrogen peroxide getting out. And it is, if it is able to get past the glutathione and the catalase, those are going to be uh, antioxidants. Then it can get somewhere like in the lysosome. And when it gets there, it will interact with uh, glucose, uh, lipids, various junk the, that the liposome has gathered in order to clean up. So, the mitochondria here are the powerhouse of the cell and the lysosomes are the garbage collectors. Whenever something goes bad, it is delivered to the lysosome, which internally has a number of uh, reagents 
to break down material into smaller constituents and then those are not harmful and release them out back into the cytoplasm. Now it turns out within the lysosome, as it is collecting this stuff, and sometimes that stuff uh, gets oxidized here with hydrogen peroxide, or it could get glycated, it can turn into a blob of a molecule that the lysosome does not have an enzyme to break down. And if the, your garbage collector can't break it down, it sort of sits there. Over time, within a lysosome, that garbage definitely accumulates. The lysosome becomes bloated. The molecules there are changing its acidity so that the enzymes no longer function as they should. And then even garbage it can clean up, it no longer can because the environment within the lysosome has changed. And this certainly causes cellular death. That, that we know. They get clogged up, bloated. They don't function well and the cell can get senescent. So this is completely plausible. There are some cases where cells have gone bad because their mitochondria got uh, radicalized or the lysosome uh, collected junk. And both of these mechanisms interfere with autophagy. The, that is, they interfere with the ability of the cell to just give up and die and say, I can't take it anymore. Which would be great, right, if our cells could enter that situation, give up, and then we clear that debris out of our organism, then it wouldn't be a problem. If it sticks around, could be problematic, right? And so for cells that don't divide, for cells that don't replenish, the brain, the heart, the eye, some of our arteries, this is gonna be extremely pro problematic, right? Their lysosomes are going to accumulate junk, and then the cell is going to enter a state where it can't do its job. My solution or Aubrey's solution is, well, let's try and clear that up. But it turns out to be very difficult. So mutations in the lysosome enzymes are known to also cause disease. These are often curable with therapy. So for the cases that we know there is a disease that somebody doesn't, a genetic disease, they don't make that enzyme. It's not in their DNA to code for it. Then we can deliver that via vaccine. They will produce the enzyme, their lysosomes will function and they will live like a normal person, modulo the fact that they gotta get a vaccine like every two weeks. A bit of a hassle, but they're alive. Now it's a little bit uh, not the best theory because again, what kills a cell doesn't necessarily cause aging or kill the organism. We would like to get rid of the cells that are dysfunctional or maybe for the brain heart and I get rid of the lysosomes from the cell, right? Just kick those pieces out and let a macrophage gather it up and take it out of the body. And there are related diseases that don't correlate with, or there are some diseases related to this garbage that correlate with age, but maybe not causative of aging, right? And I have to take this one back. It is it is very badly worded. Uh, if the effects can kill you, say accumulation of plaque within the artery, that's atherosclerosis, then definitely it is increasing your mortality risk. And that is the definition of aging that I chose. So here, I think we should actually keep this theory, right? We can't throw it out. It is not garbage itself. We have to clear out the garbage that our cells have. And that is a way in which we can maintain uh, our livelihood. Here's a very broad theory uh, known as antagonistic pleiotropy. So I'll break that down. Um, pleiotropy we know is a gene with more than one effect. Almost all genes land in this category. They have more than one effect. And so the idea is there's a little bit of antagonism in a relationship between fertility early in life and aging later in life. So there might be some genes that cause you to be energetic, young, seeking reproduction, and that that using of energy in pursuit of reproduction causes aging, right? It's like, let's use up all of our energy early in life in order to have offspring. And then whatever genes led us to have that amount of energy, they don't care after we've reproduced, 
that we're going to die. And I want to point out something like a salmon here, right? A salmon is going to go into the ocean, live for a good many years, and then one year there's a biological clock that just switches on. And they go, ah, this is the year I have to swim upstream. So they swim upstream. All the while that they're swimming upstream, their cortisol is very high. Their energy use is extremely high. They're not feeding very well. And when they get to the pond where they do spawning, they're an absolute wreck because they have aged, right? They're, and then they do the reproduction and they die off. Now, it turns out that having a bunch of salmon die in a pond upstream is very good for the offspring of those salmon, right? They do their spawning, they die off, and a few months later, the eggs hatch. When the eggs hatch, they are now in an environment that was fertilized with the resources of their parents' bodies months ago. So this is kind of an antagonistic a gene going on here, right? It's going to benefit you when you're young, but it's going to cause you uh, a very large increase in mortality as you age, and that increase is related to your ability to spawn. So it's quite plausible. Um, aging is something that is visible to natural selection, but also reproduction is visible. And we have a prediction here that there's no evolutionary pressure to stay alive post-reproduction. That's a good prediction to have in hand because it allows us to figure out that no, uh, there are some very good counterexamples. For example, shall I point out human women go through menopause and live about half their life after that event, right? So whether they reproduced or not during the time that they were fertile doesn't matter. They still go through menopause and they live a good long life after that. So there's a large number of genes that may be also associated with aging and don't grant fertility. They wouldn't factor into this theory very well, but they cause aging. So why did evolution keep them? Good question. A researcher, Michael Rose at UC Irvine, also discovered by breeding fruit flies for longevity that their fertility increased. So here the pleiotropy is not antagonistic. It's actually cooperative. Longer lived flies have more reproductive events. Very interesting. And then there's the case of epigenetics that allows the timing of genetic activity. So epigenetics is methylation of genes that can cause or influence whether or not the gene is uh, transcribed into a protein, right? And so this uh, methylation allows us to or allows the body to turn genes on and off. There are some genes that are activated when you are young, and then some event later, they are disactivated, or vice versa. And we know that epigenetics is definitely a role in humans because puberty looks like very fast aging, but post-puberty is somewhat of a pause, right? So up until your te early teenage years, uh, you have a childhood set of genes turned on and then there's some epigenetic switches and you increase testosterone and estrogen develop into an adult and then pause there so epigenetics allows for timing of genetic activity and the ability to time this means that the pleiotropy may not be antagonistic right it can be delivered when appropriate and we don't necessarily have it the case that enhanced fertility early in life is a cause of aging later in life, even though there are some example correlates like the salmon, there are example discorrelates like humans. Ah, telomere shortening. This is a very good theory too. And it gets into the case where I think sometimes we can't throw these theories out exactly. Uh, Leonard Hayflick in 1961 was trying to grow some cells in a culture. They kept dying. And this was very concerning to him because all of the research in, in the uh, biology, it was assumed and well known and nobody disputed that cells can just divide forever. 
And so Hayflick kept having his cells dying. Like, what's wrong with me? Why do my cells keep dying? He ended up counting them and figured out that they have a limit on the number of reproductions that they can do. And it turned out that other researchers in this area were cheating. So although they were very famous, they had lab assistants doing the actual cell culturing, and the lab assistants would be terribly embarrassed if the cells died off. And so when that happened, they snuck in some new cells so that they could pretend that the culture had kept going. <laughs> yes, the, uh, science is not perfect. Uh, only humans are doing it, and uh, we have our foibles. These grad students did not want to be embarrassed. Now, Hayflick was, uh, I guess, gumptious enough to raise that this was an issue for him. And later it turned out, uh, when we can do genetic sequencing, that the, there are these telomeres. Now, for humans, a telomere is a repeat at the end of, a, of the chromosome. It's sort of like a, a plastic cap or aglet on the end of a shoelace and it gets shorter with each cellular division. So for humans, that repeat is TTAGGG, and there's about 3,000 of them, uh, repetitions, when you're very young. But as your cells divide and divide and divide as you grow older, that number of repeats progressively shortens. Eventually, you get a very, very short telomere, and that cell is going to go senescent, which means it is going to go into a very paused state where it doesn't perform its function well, and maybe even exacerbates uh, the lack of this function in nearby cell, in neighboring cells. So how does it happen that these telomeres get shorter? Um, there's a lovely bricklayer example. And what happens here is as the DNA is getting replicated uh, in a cellular division event, there's an enzyme that goes around to do the replication, and it happens to fall off the end. So it does its thing, it copies, it copies, it copies, it copies, but this very end brick, uh, it needs to sit on the first layer of bricks in order to make the copy on the second, and it runs out of room to sit, and so it shortens the telomere itself. As they shorten, uh, we know that at some point, the cell will just refuse to divide. Now there is another gene, uh, right? Th this would be death for all life on earth if it happened everywhere. So how do, how do we get around this? Uh, it turns out there is a gene that activates an enzyme called telomerase, which goes through and it just replicates the sequence and can extend the, uh, the end of the shoelace. So that there are a bunch more uh, repeats there. And it turns out, where is this going to be done? Well, definitely, in a germline where you have a new organism that you are making, right? So all of your children are going to start with 3,000 repeats, even though you yourself might have only a third of that. Now, this theory is extremely plausible because cells can't divide forever. And if my cells need to do that, like I am shedding skin and hair every day, I need those divisions to continue working in order to keep my skin, then this, the population of cells in my organism is going to get depleted. So short telomeres, they can trigger cellular senescence and apoptosis, and then I will run out of cells in my organism to continue this division. It's terrible. But it's, not also, it's also not a completely correct theory because it's necessary to have shortening of telomeres. It turns out that uh, cancer cells have acquired mutations during your lifetime where they get around a few uh, epigenetic blocks that allow them to activate telomerase. And once they activate telomerase, they can replicate without problem. And replication without problem is cancerous, right? Or at the level of a bacteria, you can think that if they never were forced to go through genetic recombination events and then division, one successful bacteria DNA could replicate itself forever by continuing to activate telomerase and just doing division without recombination. And then we also know that a few cells of ours 
don't really replicate often, maybe not even at all. And so those are not involved in this telomere shortening story. Now, I believe that we should keep this theory. It is partially correct. We must preserve telomere length in our stem cell population. And that's the population of cells within my body that are undergoing division to create more skin or undergoing division to create more liver. And I need to have a small set of cells within my body to continue doing that indefinitely if I want to live forever. Ah, the disposable soma theory. It turns out uh, there's a very lovely idea, again, going back to the second law of thermodynamics, that there are limited resources, limited amounts of energy that we have to consume as organisms and use. And so in the antagonistic pleiotropy, it was the idea that, well, maybe I can make a trade-off, use a lot of energy early, and then not have enough later and die. Here it's the case that I'm going to spend energy keeping my germ cells alive. That's the line of reproduction. And then I will just not care if the body, the vessel for this germ cell uh, dies and withers away, right? Because it's my lineage that on the evolutionary scale needs to be kept intact, not the individual. And here I have a lovely picture of the immortal germ line Right? So we know that all life started as something bacterial, and then fish, and then mouse, and then human. Right, There's some kind of lineage there. Not ex the mice you encounter today are, are not your parents, but we have a shared ancestor somewhere. All throughout that, breeding and reproduction is a very continuous line of germ cells, the sperm and the egg. They continue combining to produce a new set of organisms with each generation. So this is pretty plausible. We know that the body accumulates damage. We know that the accumulation of DNA errors within any individual can be a driver of aging. And so we predict that, this is not a good prediction, we predict that maybe a reproduction event is what triggers aging. Now in some organisms, this is actually true. Right? We know of insect species where post-reproduction, one of them, and this is insects, the female usually eats the male, delicious. Uh, I'm glad that doesn't happen to me. But the reproduction event is triggering a mortality. We also know that, for example, an octopus, right? An octopus, she will lay her eggs and she will guard them for months that it takes for them to mature. And during that guarding, she does not go out for food or anything else. She just stays there with her eggs. Her body deteriorate, deteriorates, and this is completely a trigger, a program. It is her behavior, right? So her, her laying of eggs triggers her mortality. Not necessarily aging. It could just be she stopped eating. That's what causes the aging. But it definitely triggers her mortality. Now, it's a little bit not completely correct, right? Because we know that the damage is not due to an energy constraint. It's just due to mutations, encountered mutations, probably with reactive oxygen species, as that I mentioned earlier. And we also know, at least for humans, although it might feel that your children are sucking the life out of you, they, they are known as energy vampires it doesn't mean that they are causing you to age, right? So your children, the fact that you have children has not necessarily increased your risk of death. And there's something known as hormesis, whereby a challenge leads to increased fitness. So challenging you with the burden of raising children and attending to every detail of theirs and keeping their life safe might lead to an increased fitness on your part right? Exercise can make you stronger. Chasing your kids can make you fitter. And larger animals take a long time to grow up. So it's not a surprise that they're going to live longer. And the larger they get, thinking elephants and whales here, they don't have much predation risk. So the ability for animals to get large and fend off things and 
respond with increased fitness due to challenge all means that we do not have a limited resource in energy terms. So tossing the body to keep the germ doesn't make sense uh, for that reason. It might make sense for others, but not the limited resource argument. And so that is a, a good summary of aging theories that have died, right? The fixed number of heartbeats, your metabolic rate of living, mutation accumulation. Uh, I say in DNA specifically, but I mean on the evolutionary time scale. A mutation accumulation on the individual level is certainly going to increase age. But on the evolution charm scale, we, we don't see that occurring. There's the free radical theory. I can't completely dismiss it because it leads to accumulated uh, garbage. Antagonistic pleiotropy didn't stand up very well. And disposable soma, although it's observed, doesn't seem to be a cause for aging. Then the things that contribute to aging, for sure, it's accumulation of garbage, shortening of telomeres, uh, many other things that I didn't mention. Uh, your thymus gets fattier, and that weakens your immune system, and eventually something like flu gets you. You can accumulate damage and other byproducts in the intracellular matrix. So alpha-beta plaques are, uh, I want to say, claimed to cause Alzheimer's. Maybe it's just a correlate but something's, something's going on there. And you can contact me. Uh, it's just my name, erichennigan at gmail.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn, and I am at Deep Thoth on Twitter. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Eric, for that excellent, thorough presentation, an overview of the possible interpretations of biological aging that did not work out or did not turn out to be sufficiently descriptive or comprehensive, as well as some ideas that you do think hold some merit. So as the introductory question to inaugurate this panel discussion, I'm curious what you think about the controversy that is currently ongoing within the aging research community as to whether aging or senescence is the result of accumulated damage over time or whether there's a pre-programmed genetic component to biological aging such that there is uh, essentially aging by design. Where do you stand on this controversy? I, I happen to have a foot in both of those camps. So I know that for sure, accumulated damage is something that gets us. There's atherosclerosis, um, various heart disease. Uh, there's uh, brain issues such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. These things seem like they are due to accumulated damage as we are growing or, or living because we are unable to get rid of garbage in our cells. So getting rid of that might allow us to live indefinitely youthful, which would be fantastic. But I don't think that accumulated damage is going to stop something like thymus involution, where the thymus turns into a, a lump of fat, and then your immune system is weak, and something bacterial gets you, right? So in that sense, I think the thymus evolution is perhaps a biological clock that is ever ticking down. I also think that the telomeres are partly a biological clock, but here it's aimed at the body's stem cell population, right? If you run out of stem cells, then you run out of the ability to continually replenish your organism, and then you will uh, atrophy and die. So I think there's two things going on. One is like, telomere shortening in the stem cell population and evolution of thymus that weakens the immune system. Those are definitely candidates for the programming. And then accumulation damage, we know that'll get us also anyway. So I, I think it's actually both. Very interesting. So there are components of accumulated damage and components of programmed aging, and we would have to address both in order to significantly lengthen our lifespans, probably by addressing 
one of these categories, but not the other. It might be possible to lengthen the lifespans of some individuals here and there, but to reliably extend out maximum lifespan, we need to address all of these issues that arise. Yes. I'd, I'd like to remind uh, that the goal here is to remain ever youthful. It's not to be a hundred year old person with wrinkled skin and gray hair forever. It's to be like, hopefully between 20 and 30, I thought th those were some pretty good years, but I, I would take 30 or 40 as well. The, they're still pretty substantially nice. I yes, don't want to be frail forever. I want to be youthful and vigorous. Agreed, agreed. And I think for some of the first age reversal therapies, there's going to be an incremental benefit. So it's most likely that a biological 60 year old will become a biological 40 year old. But I think relative improvement in this regard is still going to be crucial for helping people to reach longevity escape velocity. Because once people can reliably gain a few extra years faster than the passage of time, then they are on that trajectory toward longevity escape velocity. So a lot of our viewers appreciate your presentation, Eric. Daniel Tweed says this was a first rate presentation and I would concur. I think you did an excellent job. Now I want to open it up to our panelists for any questions or comments that they would have for you, Eric. And I think David Shoemaker wants to begin. Yeah, thank you, Janetti. And I echo that it's, uh, it was a brilliant presentation and uh, enjoyed it very much. So my question is along this line, there's talk in the longevity community about whether aging should be categorized as a disease or not. and. Uh, that has to do with, of course, the way FDA treats diseases and so forth, as far as for uh, uh, human trials and such. So going back to this idea of aging as a disease, are diseases something that typically have like a single cause and aging appears to have multiple causes? Would that be a reason to say that aging is not a disease, or what do you think about that? Uh, I, we're going to have to quibble on what is the definition of a disease. I know that some researchers in the field think that because it happens to everybody, it is not a disease, right? So for them, the definition hinges on how, how big of a, a, a population it affects. And this is not surprising because a, a genetic scientists also have a cutoff for like one out of every thousand or something, the prevalence of the mutation for it to be caught, uh, named something, uh, put in a specific category. Um, but I think we're in very good standing on the damage theory of aging, because most of the kinds of damage do result in something that the, D that the FDA would consider a disease. So accumulation of uh, fat in the arteries due to macrophages engulfing a whole lot of lipids and getting stuck in the arterial wall is uh, atherosclerosis and the FDA recognizes that as a disease. So if we have find drugs that allow us to reverse that process or inhibit it, those are good candidates for FDA approval under their current paradigm. Now, for something like uh, your telomeres cause you to run out of stem cell uh, population, and then you cannot replenish your body, that is not something that the FDA is going to recognize as a disease. And therefore, it is something very difficult to get therapeutic approval for, even though I am convinced that we will need to treat that. So it, we are in an awkward situation here with regard to the definitions that the FDA recognizes. Yes, indeed. So do you think it would be helpful if the FDA recognized aging as a legitimate end target of research 
medical research uh, for the approval of certain devices or drugs. And whether the FDA called it a disease or a, a treatable condition, something that they could approve a treatment for, uh, do you think that would greatly speed up the pace of research as well as increase the willingness of scientists, especially in large institutions, to invest the funds to take a drug or a device or a therapy through FDA clinical trials? Yes. Uh, if, if I could... If I knew how to influence the FDA to change its mind on, on this, I definitely would. So it's already the case that the FDA is wanting to approve drugs that benefit uh, people that have a disease by curing the disease or preventing it or ameliorating its effects, right? And so why not expand on that uh, purview and say that the FDA's primary objective is to increase our health or our, our health spans, right? And if that's its objective, not the curing of specific diseases, we actually don't care if it's a disease or not anymore. All we care under that paradigm is whether or not it increases our health span. And clearly, if we can keep our stem cells and keep them reproducing, or if we can increase our youthful vigor and fitness ever into our golden years, then those therapies are, should meet FDA approval. We need to convince them to change their paradigm. Yes, I hope that we will be able to convince them. This is certainly an important mission for longevity advocates. And our viewer, Ampero, agrees. And he writes, we need our elected officials to recognize aging as a disease, even if only as a campaign issue. Well, that would be a start. And now let us go to Kent Kamish for his question. Oh, hey. Um, good. I really enjoyed that. Uh, good talk. Um, uh, I just want to... I want to bring up two things quickly. Uh, while you were talking about theories of aging, which I haven't really thought about in a long time, um, I tried to find anything following up on uh, this work that I heard about at a SINS conference like 17 years ago that the Nobel Prize winner Mario Capicchi, might be Capecci, I think it's Capicchi, um, he was going to... Uh, He's going to do this massive, crazy sounding experiment where he was going to splice bat genes or he, he was going to take a whole bunch of like different segments of the bat genome and try to splice them into mice uh, to see like if, if he could identify some of the specific things that let uh, that, that let bats live so much longer than mice. Um, and I was just Googling that and I realized that I couldn't find anything about following up uh, any sort of follow-up detail on that or anything i think maybe he retired or it was too ambitious and he gave up on it but if anybody has any information about that or can find out anything i'm just curious what happened with that and if you have any thoughts on that and the other thing is segmental progerias um and if you have, have you had any thoughts on segmental progerias and like hutchinson guilford progeria and some of those things that are known to be like single mutations that should be in theory, maybe you could find a way to reverse or halt the progression of that phenotype with gene therapy. And I don't know if anybody's working on that, but do you think that we might uh, affect segmental progerias before we get to escape velocity? Cause it seems like it's a model of aging that would be p potentially simpler to intervene in than aging itself because it's segmental it's not affecting everything anyway those two thoughts in a big ball throwing them at you thanks so i i had not heard about the genetic splicing of rat genes into mice so i, I don't oh, have any that, comments it was about bat it. genes into oh, mice bat genes. because yeah because of the much greater longevity but they're still very closely related so uh i I think it's worth doing if if somebody can find the funding for it. Uh, that's the most challenging part about doing these things. And I don't know what we'll find, but it's interesting. And a lot of mice have died in the pursuit of our knowledge. So that, that will just continue to happen. And then for the progeria, um, yeah, there are a handful of rather specific uh, diseases that look like accelerated aging that occur to children. And they usually die uh, in at very young ages. So some of these 
uh, there are treatments for. And it seems to be that the mutation on the one gene that is causing their progeria is treatable either with a vaccine that delivers mRNA or the enzyme itself. So mRNA to code for the enzyme or the enzyme itself in a way that the cells can uptake it actually cures them. The problem is since they can't, uh, their gene is broke, they have to continually take uh, this supplement. It would be nice to go through and edit their genome with a retrovirus so that it is yeah. always present there. But uh, the, there are other issues with that. The danger yeah. that it might edit some other spot is is pretty great. You, you just blew my mind. I, <laughs> I did not notice, I have not heard that there is any effective therapy for progeria. So I, now yeah. I'm gonna run off to PubMed and, and take a look at that. I, I'm, I'm really surprised by that. Yeah, th cool. there's more than one kind of progeria. And so some have right. treatments and others still don't. But ah, okay. People, uh, okay. companies are working on it. And unfortunately, with the funding model and FDA approval costs, the ones that have ever smaller number of people impacted are less likely to get funding for the drug and approval. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. so lowering the cost of approval can, can definitely help reach more people. Yes, absolutely. Lowering the cost of approval is a crucial priority given the many billions of dollars that it takes to bring a typical drug or treatment to market. Our friend and member, Daniel Tweed, with whom we had an excellent virtual enlightenment salon on September 25th, writes, I'm eager to keep campaigning on the aging as disease platform plank. And I would like to remind everyone, Daniel is running for city council in Thousand Oaks, California. We are currently in the process of holding a vote through Wednesday, October 26th at 6.01 p.m. as to whether to endorse Daniel. And I would encourage everyone to go to this link here if you are a U.S. Transhumanist Party member, and I will know if you are or not, and cast your vote for the endorsement of Daniel Tweed. I think he has definitely been a passionate supporter of longevity, and he has gone to significant lengths to put the name of the U.S. Transhumanist Party out there in Thousand Oaks, California. So thank you, Daniel, and we look forward to more of our members voting. Now, let us continue the panel conversation. I am curious, Jason Geringer, if you have any questions for Eric. Sure, I got a weird one. Leave it to me, right? Um, when, when we talk about ancient histories of uh, longevity and stuff, there's a couple things that come up in the, in the Indian uh, Vedics or Vedas, uh, there's this story about Soma. I'm wondering if that, what you think about that and, and how it correlates with uh, maybe that other thing that earlier I was hearing about Soma. And then there's another uh, where archaeologists are finding that the stories of ancient uh, Anunnaki having this uh, monoatomic gold or orbitally rearranged something like or mess or they call it or something like that and that uh, I don't know it's a, you know it's a myth in history that uh, they had some sort of you know way of longevity using some kind of monotonic gold I'm wondering if anyone else has ever heard of anything like that so <laughs> uh, so the first question about soma do you uh, do you mean the cells of the body, or do you mean a drug like the drink? A drink? There's a story of an ancient drink in in the Indian Vedas uh, about yeah called soma. I was just wondering maybe if, is that why the th other thing was named soma the, from the cells in the body? I'm wondering if they named it after that, or if you had heard of the soma to begin with, or whatever. Uh, so I had not heard of the Sumerians having a longevity drink. Uh, but I'm not surprised that many cultures uh, would attempt to claim that they have such a thing because people, especially rulers, kings, have wanted to extend their rule 
uh, ever since they uh, entered office, let's say. They're, they're but, reluctant to give it up. Yeah. Um, but that the doesn't, soul, that oh, doesn't make on. things um, effective. So my knowledge um, for, uh, that I acquired through curious reading when I, when I was in college, um, the Chinese and, and Buddhist tradition also kind of had elixirs of life and whatnot. It turned out that a component of those elixirs was cinnabar, a mercury uh, ore, and they were known to be harmful today. So uh, I, I can't put a lot of faith into these older traditions, although everything they have is worth a look we can definitely do a much deeper analysis with the technology we have available to us today. And many of those things don't pan out. So the cinnabar definitely is one that's not going to work for us. Um, for the monatomic gold and whatnot, I don't know. I, I have not looked. Yes, it is perplexing how often throughout human history there have been attempts to reverse aging and that of course is the understandable part but the perplexing part is how haphazard some of those attempts were in the pre-scientific era that is to say if the chinese emperor listened to a particular wise man who said that uh, consuming a concoction with mercury would lengthen his lifespan i wonder why there wasn't more inherent skepticism about those mm -hmm. kinds of claims, considering that it's just some person's say so. Well, they, they were the uh, premier uh, medical scientists at the time. But up, up until extremely recently, uh, medical science has been engaging in a large number of harms to the patient. And th that still occurs today by accident. But, but like, at least the field has progressed to know that soap and alcohol uh, get rid of germs. The germ theory was very important. Um, that bleeding a patient is not how you get the bad things out of them. Instead, you might actually have to transfuse blood into them. And and today now, the, the very first thing that you do when somebody presents to the ER is stop the bleeding. Right? The opposite of the bloodletting uh, mechanisms that, that were engaged in long past. So our, our science has certainly progressed uh, to very good effect, but it did take a lot of mistakes along the way. It's interesting because even as late as the 18th century, Voltaire quipped that doctors put drugs of which they know little into bodies of which they know less for diseases of which they know nothing at all. And then he also wrote that the art of medicine consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. So there was this skepticism during the Age of Enlightenment about the medicine of that time. And there was a widespread uh, aversion, actually, to going to doctors or self-proclaimed doctors because of the very high error rate that occurred and the incorrect theories that the medical practitioners of that time adhered to. Now, uh, I would like to ask Alan Crowley to pose the next question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Eric, I want to say uh, thank you. Great presentation, nice overview and uh, summary of the various uh, theories of aging that have either fallen by the wayside or are still hanging on today. Uh, how do you envision you know, propagating awareness of these theories and principles and in general this field of study to the masses? I, I don't see a big interest in it other than, you know, can I market it as a pill? How do you how do you see getting the word out? I, I think a lot of the ideas here are uh, extraordinarily challenging for people. So the idea that uh, one person might live forever just automatically raises a lot of, uh, let's say, intellectual antibodies, right? So there are emotional reactions to this story like, well, what if only the rich get to do that because the cost of the intervention is really high? That, that could be bad. 
What if only dictators and kings get to do that? Then their populace remains subjected. That's going to be bad. Um, what about the religions? Don't you want to die so that you can go to heaven and join your ancestors? Well, that's a, a little bit contentious. A lot of us don't believe that that's how it's going to work. But for those who do, I don't want to take away their right to die if that's if that's their choice. So the I've talked with people about this, and I even have a friend who believes that the way to get immortality is through children. And well, I'm childless, so I think, no, the way to get immortality is for me to live, not my genes. Yes, indeed. And I, of course, completely agree with you, Eric. And this is not an antinatalist position from my point of view, because whether or not people have children, their children are not them. They are separate individuals. So a person can make either decision with regard to having or not having children and still not consider that to be a form of immortality because the child's survival past one's own death does not perpetuate one's own direct awareness of the world. But why do you think that this argument that children are uh, a route to personal immortality, uh, why do you think that argument is so commonplace? Because uh, I hear it quite often, and it doesn't even seem to hold based on the premises of that argument, since immortality requires some sort of remembrance, some sort of legacy, and the truth is most people are not remembered, even in many cases by their great-grandchildren, not to mention the subsequent generations. So what makes that line of argument so tempting for many people? Uh, to, to buttress your point there, I, I would like to challenge everybody in the audience here. You have eight great-grandparents. Name four of them. Now, I, I think I can name two. So we aren't remembering our ancestors very well. Like, and, and these are very recent ones. So uh, that's troubling. It's also the case the vast majority of people never got an entry in any of the history books. It, that seems only to have happened for the, the ruling class or today in Wikipedia, the ones that have moved scientific and, and other fields substantially. So it's for our, our, um, our great thinkers get written there or great actors in the political case. I, and I don't consider either of those two mechanisms a great way for me to get uh, longevity. I just want to have my body and my mind live for a very long time. Now, why is it the case that we put all of our hope into children? I think because we never had a choice before, right? It's, it's always been for all of history, the case that it's our children who survive us. And so whatever we can teach them is what goes into the future. Now, in part, that's their genes. So it could just be an encoding for the desire to reproduce and again, have children. It could be cultural lessons for the desire to reproduce and have children. It's a, a very big part of religions to encourage having of children to grow the body of that religion. And this is not wrong from a uh, evolutionary standpoint uh, across many individuals, right? You want your tribe to survive in competition with other tribes in the world. So I think that's a good thing. But now we have on the table a very new option that individuals can survive for a very long time, perhaps indefinitely. And I am not completely sure of why people are so resistant to that and continue putting their chips uh, where they used to be, that is on their children. I'm not suggesting you forgo having children so you can research longevity. That's my choice. It's not for everybody. Because the children are very fulfilling in many other ways. It turns out that our, as humans, we are social creatures and it's our relationships that matter a lot to us. And one of the strongest bonds there is children. So if that could be an explanation for why chips get, keep getting placed on that bet. Indeed. And hopefully we can get people to appreciate that that bet is not a sufficient one for personal immortality. 
again, it's not a question of what people choose in this regard. I think we should welcome a diversity of choices, but it's a question of this not being used as a pretext to preclude an urgent society-wide focus on the achievement of life extension for as many individuals as possible. Now, Alan Crowley has a follow-up question, so please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about sort of the Machiavelli effect on, on scientific credibility and funding for longevity research. Um, that Machiavelli effect being um, proponents of change tend to have you know lukewarm supporters and they go against um, vested interests who have a strong opinion about not changing things and typically... Uh, and receive more scorn than praise for their innovative ideas. Um, uh, is there a, a reason that people don't come out and talk about, I'm doing longevity? I mean, Aubrey de Grey does. He says, I'm doing longevity research. But I, I see a lot of uh, the medical profession saying, well, what we're really doing is cancer research or, or something mm -hmm. like that. I, so I think it has been uh, very disappointing for a very long time. And again, like I'm guilty of being in this camp too. It wasn't until I spotted a gray hair that I thought I should pay attention to this longevity thing and maybe help out and participate in the area. So I went most of my life without, you know, even considering that this was a thing I might want to spend my time doing. And most researchers, in any of their fields are spending a lot of their time kind of around the edges and the outskirts and not focused on the largest problem in the field, in part because they think they might not be able to make a contribution on a problem so great that has stumped so many greater minds than theirs. So a little bit of timidity there, or it could be the case that they just don't have a mechanism for pooling together the resources, or it could be a case that they're making uh, progress where they know that they can make it comfortably and get funding for it, right? So it, it might be actually a disaster if we didn't have this spread in every field of some people looking at the hardest problems, brave enough to do so, and most others looking at tangential problems and making incremental progress there, because it turns out that incremental progress accumulates such that one of the great thinkers can pull all the pieces together and then make a, a good leap forward and maybe get a Nobel Prize for it. Now, I, I'm on the case where, yeah, it might not be that, that I uh, solve aging. I, in fact, I think there's many, many different uh, contributing factors to aging. So it is unlikely that I would solve aging, all of it, and it's even unlikely I would solve one small piece of it. However, I look at it like this. There's, there's a ball game going on, right? And so the biggest players in the field are on the field playing the game. But the game is attended to, by many other people in the stands that are cheering them on, that are helping them out, by many people that are not playing but are contributing. The coach and the referee and the organization that created the stadium itself Right. And all of this is very exciting to me. I would rather be in the stadium or one of the people behind the scenes helping the players, even if I don't get to be a player myself, I'd rather participate in the game than stand outside and ignore it for this game. Yes. I think there's and a lot of fun in this particular field. Biotech is going to be really big in part because computer tech has paved a bunch of the road over the last 30, 50 years. Yes, and I think the advances in computer technology certainly reveal some exciting possibilities for computational biology and deriving insights from large volumes of data. This is where actually a lot of researchers with different paradigms in regard to what causes biological aging or what needs to be done about it are similarly enthusiastic, like Michael Rose and Aubrey de Grey would both say there's tremendous potential in this field. Now, our friend Sergei Gupkin writes that he accepted aging as a fact of life until he was 
31, just because he did not give much thought to the alternative. He thinks that perhaps a lot more scientists are not focusing on aging research that would be front and center in the fight against biological aging because they fear to appear like crackpots. And that might even translate into reluctance of some members of the general public to support this field. So Eric, how would you address that fear? What means would you suggest to dispel it? So Sergey has a very good point, right? I would today be very afraid to come out as an alchemist. Fortunately, I don't have to because I'm not actually an alchemist. Um, but alchemy had a predominant position among chemists for many centuries, right? They were trying to transmute lead into gold. Along the way, they discovered a lot of rules of chemistry. So it wasn't wrong for them to spend efforts in that direction, but it was also still not a goal that they could achieve. Uh, it turns out that the physicists were able to turn lead into gold uh, in a particle accelerator, and it cost an enormous amount of money. There's no return on that. And I believe the resulting gold was radioactive. They only made a few atoms at an enormous cost. Um, similarly, there have been very many elixirs of youth and whatnot that have not achieved their objective. So we have come to accept this as a crackpot mythology. And maybe even there's some cults around today that think they can live forever by uh, doing this, that, or the other thing. The answer is no. Uh, the only way that we're going to be able to live forever in our biological form will be by maintaining the youthful state. And that means getting rid of garbage that accumulates. And, and Aubrey suggests not even worry that it gets produced. Don't stop its production. Focus on the removal. So getting rid of the garbage. And then if there happens to be a biological clock like the thymus, then halting it, pausing it, or reversing it are all options soon to be available with a lot of the tools that we have at hand, primarily being the uh, things like AlphaFold recently, the ability to figure out the three-dimensional protein shape of from a genomic sequence, are unlocking our ability to do a lot of experimentation and to discover the knowledge that we need to fix the things that are going wrong in our body. So the only way to communicate this uh, to the lay public without seeming like you're a crazy person is to just admit that we cannot do it today. We are trying to discover the rules and the limitations and the way our body works and its biology and chemistry in order to figure out how we can live longer. And, and say they don't want to live longer, right? They, they might be of a faith that finds that objectionable. They still want to live healthier. So if you can't get them more than 120 years and that's your cutoff, make it so that the first 115 years are healthy, right? At least you should be able to meet people on, on that dimension. And then that gives them a lot of time to become comfortable with the idea that they might live a few years beyond the current limitation. So the only way to spread the word is actually by talking to people and recognizing their fear, having some empathy with it, and promoting the idea that, well, don't you want to just live healthier for as long as you can, even if it's not forever? And I would say that would be a good incremental persuasion technique for people who are perhaps initially reluctant to go all the way in terms of pursuing indefinite life extension or longevity escape velocity. One component of an effective societal movement is to be able to attract as many demographics as possible. And there's an interesting conversation among our viewers in the chat. Luis Arroyo writes, we need more people under 30 involved in futurist politics. John H. responds that young people may be the least interested. I don't know if they are, but that's John H.'s view, because old age and death seem infinitely far away to them, so they may have less sense of personal involvement. And Luis responds, that is true, that along with the cost barriers and climate change, 
uh, lead the youth to be vastly disinterested. So what do you think about this assessment, Eric? And I have noticed in people younger than myself, uh, people who are under 30 today, a rise in cynicism about the state of the world that didn't really exist for our generation to the same extent. So how do we get those people to be more inclined to participate in our movement, particularly because their energy could be quite helpful right now? I, I want to say that I, I was actually in the camp prior to uh, discovering a gray hair in my beard that I thought longevity would just sort of work itself out. And if I lived long enough, I was still young, no gray hairs, then I would get to participate. But once I saw that hair, I went, oh, no, no, no. There are a lot of problems that need to be solved, and, and I might have to help out with, with a few of the smaller ones that, that are manageable for me. I do also think that the younger generation is highly cynic uh, in part because our media gets funding from advertisement and engagement, and it gets, I, those are eyeballs, eyeballs from speaking to our, uh, let, let's say, more, more hyperactive parts of the brain. And that would be the fear centers, right? So if, if a, an experimental economist or behavioral economist goes to somebody and presents them with, with a trade-off, how much good things have to happen and I give you an extra $10, how many bad things have to happen uh, for me to compensate you $10 for it. And we figure out that we have a reaction of 2x on the fear side, right? So, so you only have to take $5 away from me and it feels like 10. Whereas if you give me $10, it feels like five, right? So something to that effect. Because of that aspect of our uh, behavior, then the media focuses on stories that get more engagement. Those happen to be the ones that are uh, fearful and disastrous, et cetera, et cetera. So it is not a surprise with all of the media consumed by every one of us, but especially the young that are more impressionable, that they are getting the message that our society is doomed. Now, we have a lot of problems to solve. Some of them are existential. We do have to be serious about solving them, but it is not a case for despair for a lot of, and this will hold true only so long, for all the problems in the past that we had, we did find a way to solve them. Now that doesn't mean we solved them and saved the, the lives earlier than we could have, right? We were inefficient at some of these things, but we solved. we have solved many problems. And I believe that our technology enables us to solve many more, including the existential risks that we have today. So the only reason to despair is because your media feed is highly negative. Change your media feed, right? Working on longevity can be an impetus for you to go out and do something positive and create a positive reinforcement loop for your self-empowerment, right? Don't consider yourself a victim of climate catastrophe. Work to, ch if that's what you care about, work to change it. If that's too big in scope for you, focus on diet and exercise and personal improvement, right? I, I can fully expect that if you're 20 to 30, that is an extraordinarily good thing to spend an entire decade doing, learning about yourself and improving your abilities. Because when you're 30 to 50, you can have a very strong career built on top of that foundation, making contributions to problems that you consider worthy solving and that are now in your scope because of the personal development. Yes, that is excellent advice for our younger viewers. Thank you, Eric. And I would agree that determination rather than despair should be the answer to the problems of our time. Alan Crowley writes in the chat, if Climate catastrophe is your concern. Embrace nuclear power. And of course, the U.S. Transhumanist Party is fully in support of affordable and safe nuclear power. The next generation of nuclear power plants is like that. And I would now suggest that we hear from Ben Balweg, our director of longevity outreach, uh, with regard to any questions or comments for Eric. 
Thanks, Eric, for your presentation, the review of the theories of aging. I have two very different questions. First one, I really thought today was going to be more about like the flops in um, trying to cure aging back in the day, like those elixirs of youth, et cetera. And I kind of wondered if you had heard of the um, the testicle one from like 120 years ago or so, if you wanted to recount that one or any others that were kind of funny or something. But then totally other one, I was curious um, which uh, routes of research you felt are most compelling. I guess I feel like for me, I just don't quite know what I'd be like, oh yeah, that really, we got to work on that and that'll figure it out. So what, what do you find most compelling? Yeah, uh, I'm not aware of testicles being something that will help you live longer. However, if you happen to live in the Midwest, you can still get Rocky Mountain oysters. I, I believe they serve them in some restaurants in Texas. Won't help you live longer, though. The um, What can I do today to uh, increase my longevity? And, and here is my biggest disappointment in the field of longevity research itself. A lot of the interventions that we have seen for yeast and mice and fruit flies and C. elegans, worms and, and planaria, etc., don't hold for humans, right? It's just that humans are, are very complex creatures. Um, there's a lot of non-compliance when you have humans in an experiment. There's a, a large number of genes with many different proteins circling around. Our environment has shifted uh, radically in the in the last 50 years, uh, just specifically on diet and nutrition alone, there's been a very large shift. And so what can you do today? Um, sadly, it is the two things that people find impossible to change, it's diet and exercise, right? And some people promote uh, organic foods. I like to promote, say, uh, fresher foods. Now it turns out like fresh vegetables are a terrible source of calories. They're a really good source of uh, mineral and other low amount nutrients that you definitely need, but they're a terrible source of calories. Now, I don't think you'll have a problem finding calories in America on anything else. Uh, my, my favorite happens to be cheesecake. It's calorically dense and delicious, but it's not going to extend my life. <laughs> it's just an enjoyment. Um, try fasting a 24 hour fast every week. You could do that on a Saturday or a Sunday. It's pretty easy. You just have dinner the previous night and don't eat until dinner the next day. It's pretty easy to do. Um, it turns out the caloric restriction uh, works in mice. It gives them like 30 to 50% uh, increased longevity. And it doesn't seem to work in humans for longevity, but it certainly does work in humans for health. So going through an, a fast every week is going to increase your insulin sensitivity and challenge your body in a way that it's not normally challenged. And that will cause a hormesis effect whereby you become more resilient. So you'll definitely be healthier for doing something like that. And then the exercise, do, do something of some kind, right? If you don't do heavy lifting, uh, it turns out it's a strongly nootropic effect. It's it's very positively enhancing for the mind. I have not yet adopted it, but might in, in the short future as my mind deteriorates. Um, there's also running and cardiovascular health. We know that a lower resting heart rate is good. The ability to process oxygen is very good. So you have to undergo the challenge of exercise. And we know that um, also towards the later years, there's a, a disease known as sarcopenia which is age-related uh, muscle loss. I'm not sure what the root cause is, but certainly it's the case that if you continue lifting heavy weights, you can preserve what muscle you have for a longer period of time. And the ability to move around, be comfortable, have good balance are all going to lower your mortality risk because they reduce, well, they increase your confidence and they reduce your chance of having a, a fatal fall. So what kills a lot of older people is they will fall, break a bone, they're old, so it takes a very long time to heal. During that time, they are sedentary and their body completely weakens and they don't fully recover. So avoiding that fall can be very good for your uh, health span, even though it's not going to increase your maximum age. 
Yes. Can I do the follow-up real quick? Certainly. Um, I will totally vouch for fasting. I had some of my best blood tests from a regimen I am currently um, practicing. Um, but then, so this uh, uh, testicle thing, so it's from uh, Spring Chicken, Stay Young Forever or Die Trying by Bill Gifford from 2015. And chapter one talked about uh, brown, brown hyphen Sicard, S-E-Q-U-A-R-D. And I guess in the late, late 19th century, uh, this combo was uh, practiced of injecting testicle matter. And um, I, I think it was fast disproven, but it was just kind of a funny, like, oh, curious what we were trying back in the day. I'll, I'll, I'll give an, an opposite follow-up to that. Um, so we know that uh, women live seven to eight years longer than men. It seems to be the case that testosterone is poisoning us. And we have this indication from studies of eunuchs. So these are folks that were castrated probably against their will in more than one area of the world. But the long-term consequence of that is they had less testosterone because they were castrated pre-puberty. And they ended up living longer than men of their, of their generation. So I... I, maybe I can recommend that, but not really. One, so chemical castration, I guess, is a thing, but I think it's only recommended maybe for if you are showing like signs of prostate cancer or something like that. But otherwise, the medical community is kind of like, nah, don't do that to yourself. Yep. And, and it's already too late for me. <laughs> yes, we're not recommending any such... Uh, practices here at the Virtual Enlightenment Salon. Uh, but it is interesting that this was a notion that had also been tried and debunked uh, before by Brown Sicard. And I would like to thank Alan Crowley for his generous contribution, as well as his good words regarding our salon. I think indeed this has been quite a thought-provoking conversation. And I also want to thank John H. for his generous contribution earlier. And he says the market was kind to us this week. So I'm glad that some of those gains are translating to the salons. Now let's go to Art Ramon for any questions or comments from him. Hey, Eric, thanks for coming on the show. Um, yeah, I've got a, a question that I've sort of posed before in the past to other people, but maybe I just kind of asked it wrong. But uh, as far as mitochondrial degradation, what is the main difference between the mitochondria in a somatic cell that degrades over your lifetime versus the mitochondria in your germ cells and the ova that seems to go on through generations and does not have that sort of degradation? Do you have any idea? But that, that is a good question I had not considered. So uh, you point out correctly that uh, sperm cells don't have mitochondria. Uh, it is inherited from the ova, so you get all the mitochondria from your mother. And I am not sure as to what allows the egg cell to have a good functioning mitochondria until the point of reproduction, at which it forms a seed for well-functioning mitochondria for all the subsequent divisions of the child. Okay. So I, I, I just don't know. All right. What, what I've sort of read is that basically every human female is already born with the ovas. They're going to have their entire lifetime. So those ova are created by the germ cells, and then they're populated with mitochondria, but they sort of go into a stasis, and they do not age because the egg is kept alive by the other tissue of the germ cell. So in essence, the mitochondria that goes from generation through generation through generation via female, it basically only has several days of aging and then it goes into stasis, it, like for the entire time until it, it is uh, you know, re, you know, fertilized and it grows into another female. So that's what I sort of gathered that is happening, the difference between mitochondria in, a, in the germ cells slash uh, ova versus somatic cells. But to me, it seems that even those few hours of 
creation where it's, it's sort of active that maybe eventually over many, many generations that, you know, it is going to age and sort of accumulate uh, mitochondria, uh, you know, degradation. Uh, so that's, that's a thought that keeps going through my head. And I know I've asked this before with other people, and I usually botch the question. <laughs> this is probably the best time best time I've ever asked it this clearly. But that's that's the impression I get of, of why the difference uh, between the mitochondria, between somatic cells and the ova. Uh, I don't know about germ cells, or I'm sorry, uh, stem cells. I, I don't know how that would work. Uh, any idea as far as uh, in your bone marrow, you have stem cells? What is going on with the mitochondria there? Uh, I I don't I want to uh, propose a, a theory as to why it might be that the egg has a well-functioning mitochondria. Suppose that it it had a malfunctioning mitochondria. Maybe all the malfunctions that could happen are so deleterious that it would not be able to do the reproduction to make a child. So it can't do the cellular divisions or what cells do divide uh, don't have enough energy because the mitochondria are dysfunctional that the entire organism just doesn't make it into becoming a child. So that is one selective effect that might be uh, taking place. For the uh, bone marrow and, and other stem cells, I'm not quite sure. I do know that uh, when mitochondria become dysfunctional, they are supposed to break apart and be delivered to the lysosome for recycling. So it, it's definitely the case that in cancers and whatnot, there are, and the case in senescent cells, where they have a population of mitochondria that have undergone a mutation such that they do not enter the apoptosis and destruction that they're supposed to undergo. So those mutations allow the mitochondria to persist and remain dysfunctional and take up space in the cell, not doing much or doing harmful things that cause the cell then to enter a bad state. And, and that could be cancerous or it could just be, uh, it, it keeps uh, splitting up. In the case of stem cells, it keeps splitting up and then the daughter cells happen to have dysfunctional mitochondria and undergo the same process. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and and the the comment I put in the uh, in the chat uh, that was an experiment where they tried to uh, I know increase testosterone for like older people. Uh, I think it was a Russian. Uh, you know, he took slices of chimpanzee testicle and actually implanted it in humans, and they became very vigorous. Uh, but I didn't know about the age extension part of it. I just uh, knew about the uh, testosterone sort of replacement therapy that he was sort of trying to, to create. So, yeah. All right. And Kent Kamish referenced a paper that hey. is entitled uh, Dynamic Regulation of Mitochondrial Genome Maintenance in Germ Cells. Kent, would you like to discuss that a bit? <laughs> I'm actually looking at it and I'm trying to get a good, I'm trying to reduce what I'm reading to some kind of common sense answer to how are mitochondrial genomes uh, maintained as they, because they, you know, they just go through this one bottleneck of just a single oocyte, probably with like, um, uh, there's something called, uh, what was it called? Mitochondrial hetero, heteroplasmy, I think. Uh, studied by this guy named uh, Rafael Smigrotsky, if I'm getting the name right. Um, they 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 uh, they they were working on some really impressive things related to that. And again, that like disappeared into the ether like 15 years ago, and I don't know what's up with it now. Um, but just like looking over this review article, it it seems it just like having looked at it for a minute, I would guess. Uh, that there's something about the fact that, and maybe this is actually kind of what Eric was saying, because while Eric was saying all that, I was trying to read this paper, um, is that you end up with very few copies in a particular oocyte. And uh, maybe there's some mechanism where if that oocyte uh, 
that oocyte doesn't get to that point if it doesn't have uh, a robustly functional maternal DNA. Um, but yeah, it's uh, not a super clear answer to that uh, really good question. Very least, interesting. Very interesting. Well, thank you, Kent, for sharing that. And Jennifer Hughes, of whom we endorsed for mayor of Camden, New Jersey last year, writes that she loves when someone is able to say, I'm not sure, or I don't know, instead of just saying something for the sake of saying it. I think uh, that applies to uh, both Kent's comment and Eric's earlier response. So uh, it's good to have intellectual honesty. I agree. So we have four minutes left in our salon today. I would like to ask for one a closing comment from a panelist, whoever wants to provide it, and then a brief closing statement from Eric. So who on the panel would like to offer a concluding thought? David Shoemaker. I held back there for a second because mine's a bit of a whimsical one, as it turns out. So a lot of great information today and a couple of takeaways for me is that increased fasting, decreased cheesecake and testosterone, which leads to perhaps decreased sex, will give me many more happy years. I think I've become a big fan of the repair theory. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And the monkey testicle thing I'll pass on to. <laughs> I mean, well, imagine trying to sell that experiment. Okay, what do you want to do? Implant monkey testicles. Um, I'm going to pass. Yes, well, fortunately, <laughs> that's one of the debunked uh, theories of how to uh, address biological aging. I am honestly not sure what the proponents of that theory were thinking. Uh, perhaps something that uh, far out was considered to have some possible effect just because it's too bizarre to have been tried routinely in uh, history up until that point. But uh, that's all I can uh, venture to speculate on that. Uh, now, in the two minutes we have left, I hope that Eric could provide us with some closing thoughts, how would you characterize the discussion that has transpired? And is there anything that you would like to add that has not been mentioned yet? I, I thought we had a wonderful discussion and I was super happy to be part of this uh, virtual enlightenment and hope that it provides uh, not only uh, information for useful information for folks, but motivation for them to get into the field. And I'd like to comment further on that motivation, um, the problems of aging are many fold, right? There are multiple causes contributing to our aging and we need an enormous number of scientists and researchers and engineers contributing to this. So if it interests you in any way at all, try and find a way to get into the field. It's sure to be extraordinarily exciting, even if you're, all you end up doing is increasing your health span you'll still have a very good positive benefit on your own life and others. Yes, absolutely. And thank you to Eric for joining us today and for encouraging other people to join this field in any capacity that you're able to contribute. You're going to meet some of the most interesting, the most intelligent, the most thoughtful, the most accomplished people in the world. I would say, and people with whom you would be able to have conversations like the one we had today. I am always thrilled to participate in these virtual enlightenment salons, not just because of the amount of information we learn, but because of the innovative ways in which we probe for how we can make progress going forward. So thank you, Eric. You certainly contributed to our search for solutions to the problem of aging. And I wish you all the best in your contributions to the field as you delve into it further. And thank you to all of our 
audience members, our panelists, including our guest panelists, Alan Crowley and Ken Kamish. And I hope that you all live long and prosper. <laughs>